Now you know what pre-trained models are, how do you select one to use in a real world project? In this section, you will walk through a hypothetical real world scenario, breaking down the problem into the following steps. First, what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve? Secondly, once you know the problem, what models do you know of that could assist you in solving that problem? And then finally, considering all identified usable models, how do you select one to deliver the best solution? So let's get to it. So first up, imagine a real customer has contacted you and states, I'd like to create a web app that can detect and alert me when an intruder is in my garden, but does not send any of my images to the cloud. Let's break this down. One thing right away that you can take note of is that the customer wants a web app. This means TensorFlow.js could be a great fit as you know it can run both client-side in the browser and also server-side via Node.js in the cloud. However, the privacy was also of key importance. And in this case, TensorFlow.js client-side in a browser is the only option. Diving deeper into the requirements of the app, it will need to detect when an intruder is in the user's garden. Upon clarifying with the customer what that really means, what is an intruder, it seems you'll just need to detect humans and not cats, dogs, or other animals that may also enter. This means you'll want to make a system that knows when a human is in a given frame of the video stream. All right, so you've already seen a few models that could potentially do this. In fact, can you guess which ones could detect the presence of a person? Feel free to pause the video here and note down which ones you might consider before you continue to see if you got them all right. I'll wait for you to do that. All right, let's check your options from these known pre-trained models. Technically speaking, all of the listed vision and human body models could be used to detect the presence of a person in an image. And yes, that includes the face and hand models too. It's also worth noting that depending on the requirements, sound could also be used to detect the presence of talking, even if the person's not visible. It's often quite surprising how many ways you can solve a given problem. Now let's assume after checking with the customer that sound is not suitable as they have very talkative neighbors and they don't want to accidentally detect that. In that case, you've got a choice of the following. Image classification, object detection, body segmentation, pose estimation, face landmark detection, or even hand pose estimation if the hands are in the shot. Let's break down these to see the pros and cons of each. In these situations, it's helpful to fill out a table of features that matter to the task that you're trying to solve. Some common key things to always check include the inference speed, which is the time it takes from sending new data as input to the model to getting an output prediction. Lower times, typically measured in milliseconds, mean faster performance, but can also sometimes be measured in frames per second. For example, 10 frames per second would mean it takes 100 milliseconds to run, as you could run it 10 times before a second would have elapsed. This is important when working with real-time applications such as video, as often video will need to run at 24 frames per second or greater. If the model runs slower than this, some video frames will have to be skipped for classification, which might be acceptable depending on your use case. But typically, if the classification time drops below 10 to 15 frames per second, the application may appear to feel laggy, especially if you're trying to deal with fast moving objects, which would lead to a less than beneficial user experience. You might also want to check the amount of memory the model uses, both in terms of raw file size, typically measured in megabytes, where less is better if you want the page to load faster, but also in terms of runtime memory used to execute it, which is the amount of RAM it will need to run on the machine, which again is typically measured in megabytes. With modern machines having a lot of RAM and fast internet connections, this is becoming less of an issue, but you should still be mindful of these things as your end users might not have the same luxuries. And on that point, knowing your user's expected working environment will help decide which models are not suitable faster, and of course, avoid disappointment later. As web engineers and designers, you may already be used to this. Modern websites need to be designed responsibly based on the device it's being run on. And the same rules apply here for machine learning models you might choose to load. Back to our example scenario, after checking with the customer, you learn they want to run the system on a spare smartphone that they have lying around, but fast internet is available at all times as it will be connected to the house Wi-Fi. So it's now time to fill out a table to help us reduce the options. But how? 
Well, if you're lucky, the documentation for a model may include a performance section that details some of these metrics already. Check this first to save time. In fact, a screenshot of the pose estimation model documentation is shown here that shows the expected frames per second you can achieve on different devices. However, no details for memory usage and file size are provided. For undocumented items, you'll need to benchmark the model yourself by creating a simple website that loads the model and uses it, recording these values yourself on the device of interest. Let's walk through how to record these values if they're not already provided for you. First, frames per second, you can simply record a timestamp just before you execute the model and then record the timestamp once you get a result. Subtract the two and you'll have the number of milliseconds it took to execute. To convert this into frames per second, you can simply divide this number into 1000 as 1000 milliseconds represents one second. So if it took 50 milliseconds to run, 1000 divided by 50 would give you 20 frames per second. Now for file size, you can check this pretty easily in the Chrome developer tools. You can press F12 on your demo page to open it or simply right click anywhere and choose inspect. Once loaded, switch to the network tab and ensure disable cache is selected. Then refresh the web page using Ctrl F5 or by manually refreshing the web page in the browser window. And as the page loads, you'll see all the web page assets being loaded too. Note that it might take some time to complete loading all of them. Now TensorFlow.js models consist of a model.json file along with the associated binary files that use the .bin extension, for which there could be multiple binary files loaded. Once the web page has stopped loading and is working as intended, Thought of the recorded results for the model.json and the bin files, from which you can add up the file sizes of each to get a total model file size. For this example model, it's around 4.8 megabytes of total data transferred to the browser, as you can see. Similarly, for RAM usage, again, open the Chrome Developer Tools once the application is running and ensure that the model is being used as intended. You can now switch to the memory tab and take a snapshot and then switch to the statistics view to get an overview of how much RAM is being used. Note how in this case, this is a larger size than the file size of the model itself, totaling around 56.6 megabytes of RAM usage at runtime. Okay, so let's assume these are the benchmarks you get for the models of interest. You know that for real-time applications, you probably want at least 10 frames per second. Looking at the table, you can see that the body segmentation model only runs at two frames per second on the target device. For this reason alone, it's probably not suitable for this mobile use case, so you can safely drop it from the contenders. However, it should be noted that there might be other body segmentation models out there that run much faster, but that would require further research and investigation. Let's just stick to the models you know for now. Okay, so now let's look at the file sizes. Typically, a smaller file size may be preferable for a web page that's reloaded all the time, especially if it's loaded over a 3G connection on a mobile device. However, given your use case, where you load the page once and then leave the app running, this is less of an issue for our customer. The overhead of waiting, say, two more seconds to potentially use a better model is acceptable here. And remember, the customer for this use case also specified that the device will have access to fast Wi-Fi, so download time is not really an issue. You can therefore still consider all of the models shown for this example scenario. Now looking towards the RAM usage, you can see that face landmarks and hand pose are really high with 70 and 125 megabytes respectively. Given that the intention is to run on a mobile device, which might also be an older generation model, maybe with just one gigabyte of RAM, it would be wise to be mindful of this in case the user decides to run other apps simultaneously. Furthermore, not all humans have hands, which makes the hand pose model less reliable for those use cases. And also detecting the face would not work well if the human was wearing a mask. So this is also potentially a poor solution. Let's discard both of these for now. You're now left with three contenders, image classification, object detection, and pose estimation. The next step would be to try all three of these models to check if there are any obvious flaws in using them for the intended use case, and also what unique benefits can each provide. One thing you might consider next is the number of humans in the image. While this was not an original request from the user, two of the remaining models support detection of multiple people, object detection and pose estimation. As a developer, it makes sense to offer such functionality as this information could be beneficial given the use case. Remember, 
image classification will simply be a binary yes or no if a human is somewhere in the image or not, but not where or how many, which is less useful to you. So given that object detection offers more information with faster performance and almost half the RAM usage, it makes sense to drop image classification from consideration at this point too. So now you have two models left to choose from. Diving deeper into the documentation for both, you can discover that object detection by default can detect up to 20 objects simultaneously and can even go higher if needed at the sacrifice of inference speed. The pose estimation model, by contrast, can detect a maximum of six people at one time and uses over twice the amount of RAM to do so. For this use case, the pose model may not scale well if a larger group of people came and you wanted to know how many people there were. That being said, it is over two times faster than the object detection, so that could be better for fast moving people. Both of these models are suitable contenders. You might at this point want to ask the customer if detecting the presence of six people is enough, and if they agree, then it makes sense to use the pose estimation model as it's faster. If they need the extra granularity to count a larger crowd, then maybe the object detection model will be the way to go. As you've seen, the model you ultimately choose will depend on your customer's needs and the environment on which it needs to run. It's not always immediately obvious which model will perform the best without further investigation and research. And as a developer, it's up to you to decide what provides the optimal solution to bring the idea to life in the best way possible. Now, in the next section, you will create your first full end-to-end -end project from a completely blank canvas, where I will show you step-by-step -step how to make your very own smart camera, just like the one you explored in this scenario using the object detection model that you just selected. So get your coding hat on and I'll see you in the next section to put what you've learned into action. Mm -hmm.